Hello, Mr. Hardy here, and in this video I would like to teach you about Act 5, Scene 3 of Macbeth by Shakespeare. So firstly you need to be familiar with this scene, you may have read it, listened to it, watched it, or studied it before, and you're using this video to refresh your memory or to gain a deeper understanding. Again in this video I'll start by summarising the plot, exploring the key characters, themes, context, quotes and techniques you may need to know for your exam, and I'll leave you with a post video question you can answer if you wish to do so. So let's get started. What happens in Act 5, Scene 3 of Macbeth? Well we are in Macbeth's castle, which is in Dunsinane, and Macbeth opens the scene by repeating the three witches' prophecies to himself. He particularly focuses on two. Till Great Burnham Wood moves to Dunsinane, he cannot taint with fear. And fear not Macbeth, no man born of woman shall ever have power upon thee. And he sort of repeats them to himself. I think he's sort of comforting himself. Perhaps he's feeling nervous at his position in life at the minute. A servant then enters the scene and announces to Macbeth that the English army, which is made up of 10,000 men, is outside the castle. Uh, this is the army that Macduff went down to England to muster uh, along with Malcolm, and they've been lent um, Seward to lead the army. He's an English general. Um, Macbeth gets quite angry with this servant and dismisses him. Um, then Macbeth calls for Satan, who is his chief servant, his number one servant, and commands him to get his armour ready for battle. And Satan actually says, you don't have to do it yet, but Macbeth says, no, get me my armour, I want to fight, I want to deal with this in combat. Um, Macbeth then checks in on the Doctor and asks about Lady Macbeth, and the Doctor says, well, it's not actually a physical disease, it's more of a disease of the mind, a sickness of the mind. And Macbeth, clearly not understanding about this, just commands the Doctor to heal Lady Macbeth, which obviously he can't do because it's in Macbeth, Lady Macbeth's mind. Okay, uh, who are the key characters in this scene? Well, of course we have Macbeth, and he's presented in a few different ways. Um, first of all, he's presented as nervous, um, and this is shown by him leaning on the witch's prophecies to get some comfort. He sort of talks to himself, actually, until the wood moves to Dunsinane, I cannot be harmed. Actually, no man born of a woman shall harm me. He's sort of repeating them to himself, almost like a mantra to, to keep himself feeling calm and in control, because in reality, his world is crumbling around him. Um, Macbeth is presented as angry when the servant comes in to give him news. Uh, you would expect a king to say thank you and process the news, but Macbeth replies, the devil damn thee black, thou cream-faced loon, um, which is basically him using colours to insult um, his servant. So he's quite an angry character at this stage. Um, when Macbeth asks Satan, his chief servant, to bring him his armour, I think you can interpret this one of two ways. Some people can see Macbeth as being brave because he's willing to go into battle and deal with his problems like a man, as it were, and face Macduff and face Malcolm and, and deal with the situation man to man. Or you could interpret it that he's being bloodthirsty because, of course, he reckons he cannot be killed by any of these men. Um, so he might be out there just to sort of slay them all and, and, and have a bloodthirsty revenge. So some audience members might view it as brave, some might view it as bloodthirsty. I'll leave that to you. Um, Macbeth does come across as quite demanding. Um, he demands that Satan get his armour ready. He demands that the Doctor cure um, Lady Macbeth. I mean, a king demanding his servant to get his armour ready is understandable, um, but a king demanding a Doctor to cure um, someone's mental illness is, is, shows a lack of understanding on Macbeth's part. Um, the servant enters the scene, and they don't really do much. They just further the plot. They announce that the English army is on the doorstep of Macbeth's castle. Um, Satan, I've already explained, is Macbeth's chief servant. He's actually the only servant to get a name. All the other servants in the play are referred to as servant. Um, so does this make Satan significant? I don't really know. Um, I have read some papers that suggest Satan, which is pronounced Satan, as in the devil. Um, there might be some kind of connection there in that Satan is the bearer of bad news or somehow tempts or manipulates Macbeth into a hellish outcome. Um, really, I, I don't know enough to say 
whether I agree with that, but I'm just putting that out there for those keen students who may want to do that reading for themselves. Um, the Doctor is presented as quite wise in this scene. He, he seems to understand that Lady Macbeth is not physically ill, but rather mentally ill, and that he can't help her. Um, he also, at the very end of the scene, he has the last um, couple of lines, which we call a rhyming couplet, which Shakespeare often uses to end the scene. He says, Were I from Dunsinane, away and clear, Profit again should hardly draw me here. Um, he sort of seems to realise that Macbeth's castle, uh, maybe Scotland itself, or anywhere where Macbeth is, is a dark place, a place where he doesn't want to be. He's quite wise to the situation. Okay, what themes do we see in this short scene? Um, we have the supernatural. Uh, we don't see the witches, or we don't see God, or anything like that. But what we do see is Macbeth trusting in the witches' prophecies a lot, leaning in on them, relying on them for his sanity. Um, we get this idea of masculinity. So we've explored gender roles in previous videos, particularly with Lady Macbeth sort of subverting femininity and calling on spirits to unsex her and, and give her masculine qualities. Um, Macbeth, at the start of the play, showed really positive masculine qualities. He was fighting for his king, his country, um, he was a great leader. He seemed to have lost his masculinity along the way in the play, but now he's kind of regaining it towards the end in Act 5. He comes across as commanding and combative, which would have been expected of men, not only in 11th century Alba Scotla, um, but also in 16th century Jacobi in England, though perhaps in a lesser extent. Um, we have the theme of ambition here, and what we really see is the consequences of over-ambition. Uh, most of the play is about Macbeth and Lady Macbeth's ambition to be king and queen of Scotland, um, and now in Act 5 we sort of see the consequences of overreaching, being over-ambitious. Lady Macbeth becomes mentally unstable, um, and Macbeth is, well, if you've read the play, you know what happens to him uh, in the last couple of scenes. Um, and finally we have the theme of power. And what's happening here is there's a power struggle over Scotland. Um, Macbeth wants to hold on to his, his crown and his throne and power, whereas uh, Macduff, uh, Malcolm, the English army, want to overthrow Macbeth and reclaim power over Scotland. So, key context. In 1296 and in 1298, England actually invaded Scotland under the rule of King Edward I. And the reason I include this historical fact is because Shakespeare wasn't only a great writer, he was a great reader, particularly of history. Um, and we know from previous videos that there are real historical elements in the play Macbeth. For example, Macbeth was a real historical figure, so was Banquo. Um, and here's another example of a real historical event being referenced in the play, the English invasion of Scotland. Um, so what I want you to take away, if you study other Shakespearean historicals as well, is that Shakespeare is well read in history and often brings elements from the real history into his plays where he fictionalises it or changes it to serve the purpose of his play and to entertain the audience or to bring across his message. Um, I also want to go back to this uh, dramatic technique of cross-cutting. This is when you alternate scenes to build excitement and tension. Um, so... In Act 5, Scene 1, we were in Macbeth's castle. In Act 5, Scene 2, we were outside the castle. In Act 5, Scene 3, we're back in the castle. Um, following on this pattern, in Act 5, Scene 4, we are outside the castle again. Um, Cross-cutting is used sometimes in films uh, to switch between different scenes and alternate back and forth so the audience knows what's happening in both storylines. Um, but it's also used in theatre too to sort of create excitement and chaos and tension on the scene. Um, I've seen some performances where all of scene one is on stage and then it clears off and switches to scene two and then they clear and switch back to scene three. Um, I've sometimes seen it where the stage is split in two and half the stage is dedicated to scene one, half to scene two and then back to three and four. Um, just know that this technique is being used to build to a, a climactic ending, an exciting tense dramatic ending. Okay, key quotes from the scene. Um, right at the start of the scene, I mentioned that Macbeth is leaning in on the supernatural prophecies and deriving comfort from them. Um, I've just picked out one quote here. Till Burnham Wood remove the Dunsinane, I cannot taint with fear. Um, I have explained that Macbeth comes across as quite combative. He's one He wants to fight to solve his problems, quite a masculine idea. Um, he says, give me my armour. This is a command, an imperative he gives to Satan. 
Um, I also mentioned that Macbeth is quite commanding, as you would expect a king to be, although here, when he commands the doctor to cure her of that, it really shows a lack of maybe care or a lack of insight or understanding into the situation. So, what can you do now? Uh, you can make some notes from this video on a physical copy of the play, and if you want, you can answer this question. How does Shakespeare's presentation of Macbeth differ in Act 1 and in Act 5? Uh, I'm sure you can agree with me that Macbeth comes across very differently in Act 1 and in Act 5. In Act 1, he's quite brave and he has integrity and honour, and in Act 5, he's lost quite a lot of those qualities. Um, could you maybe draw up a table of some similarities and differences? Um, similarities might include that in Act 1 and Act 5, he was willing to fight. He showed sort of masculine qualities. Those are similarities. Um, you might come up with some differences. Uh, Macbeth was loyal to the throne in Act 1, whereas he's usurped and taken the throne and is tyrannically ruling in Act 5. And I'm sure you can draw some other differences as well. Um, and then using those similarities and differences, write a few paragraphs explaining how Shakespeare's presentation of Macbeth has differed in Act 1 and in Act 5. If you found this video useful, please give it a like. Uh, please consider subscribing to my channel to get the rest of my Macbeth and Shakespeare analytical videos, and feel free to leave a comment if you think I missed out any key bits of information. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you on the next one.